this case, to provide developers with tools that aid them in the process of, of writing this type of applications. Uh, and actually, that's what we have been doing for years uh, in, in this business. Uh, if you think about how media development happened like maybe 20 years ago, uh, back then, application developers have, have to dealt with things like media formats and codecs in the, in the application. There were no things like GStreamer, for example. And at some point, we realized that that didn't make sense and that we could create uh, frameworks, libraries that could be bundled with platforms uh, so that application developers didn't have to do all that work once and once again. So what I think we need to do nowadays is the same, but dealing with a new problem, which is uh, all these different media providers. We want to remove that work from the application side and move it to the platform so we, we can enable collaboration and code reuse. So basically a solution uh, like this brings a number of benefits. One is, as I was saying, that we enable collaboration. It's not a solo effort anymore. Uh, platforms create projects in which interested parties can collaborate and share some of the development and the, and the maintenance work. We reduce the application's complexity uh, because a lot of the code that would usually go to the application side now goes to the platform side. Because of that, we cut down development time and, and costs from the application developer. We also help them achieving consistent solutions because if platforms address the problem properly and they uh, kind of decouple the applications from the actual media providers, they are, they are already giving more consistent APIs to the, to the application developers and uh, making the work of integrating all these different con uh, content providers much easier. Scalability, uh, since we are not alone in these efforts anymore and we are, have enabled collaboration uh, amongst interested parties, we now have a more scalable solution because we can share maintenance and, and development efforts. We also get a more reliable, um, more reliable building blocks for our solutions because, once again, since we have many parties collaborating together in, in these building blocks at the platform level, we know that our code is built on top of something that's being tested by, by more people, used by more people in other, in other products and solutions, and that makes our solution more, more reliable as well. And then in the case of a, an open platform like, B, like Migo, we also get all the community support that comes with, with the platform. Okay, so we did, with this I explained uh, the problem we are trying to, to, to address with, with Willow and how I think the solution should be implemented. So that's basically what, what we are doing in Grillo. We designed it to be a platform level solution, uh, a library, a framework that's uh, shipped with uh, platforms like Migo, for example, uh, and acts as a bridge between applications and the media providers. Grillo is a free software, it's licensed under the LGPR license, and the way it works is that it exposes a single API for application developers. That's the only API they have to learn and use. And this, through this API alone, they can access content from any uh, service that's supported by Grillo. Uh, so basically the idea is decoupling the application's code from the actual media provider. So you can write an application that's completely independent of uh, any real media provider and because of that, you can then integrate more, service, uh, more services easy, easily. So uh, I explain this in more detail with this um, graphic here. I'll explain it bottom up. So at the bottom, we have a bunch of yellow boxes representing actual media services, like YouTube, like Gemendo, or your own collection of, of media uh, on, on, on your local storage, UPnP servers, and whatever. Usually at the platform level, in green, you have a bunch of libraries or different technologies that you can use and would help you grabbing content from these services. So for example, if you want to get content from YouTube, you would need some XML parsing technologies and you would learn, for example, LibXML or, or, or whatever. Then if you also want to grab content from your local storage, in the case of Mingo, you would use Tracker for that probably, and then you would learn about Tracker and LibTracker. Uh, if you want to access UPnP servers, then you have 
to learn about the UPMP protocol and you have lived UPMP for that and so forth. So these are all the technologies, APIs and protocols I was mentioning before. Usually applications would sit just on top of these libraries and that's what makes them so complex because they have to integrate all these green boxes within the application. So what we do with Grillo is uh, we sit right in between applications and these uh, supporting libraries uh, and we expose what I call here uh, the Grillo framework API to the applications. And that's the only thing they have to, lo to, to learn and use. And by doing this, we hide all these green boxes, all these different uh, uh, APIs, all, the, all these different technologies from the application developers. Now, Willow has backends or plugins for all these different media providers, which are the ones that deal with these platform-specific libraries and, and, and utilities. But all that, all that complexity lives in Grillo, and it's completely hidden from the application developer. Okay, and now I'm going to show you uh, one quick demo of an application, MIG application using uh, Grillo. So basically what we have here is uh, an application that's called Media Explorer, was developed by Intel for their uh, MIGO for netbooks uh, user experience. And basically it's a media center kind of application. And what it does is allows you to browse content from your local storage and also browse in local and also other kind of providers. Uh, so here we are browsing videos and photos, but this is the search functionality. So for example, we search uh, Migo, and what happens is that this searches on many different uh, services. It searches on Tracker, but it also searches your podcast database, on YouTube, on Vimeo, and if you have more services integrated in the application, it would also search on more things. And from that point forward, it's, it's a regular media center, so it has a, a player and, and all that stuff. So basically, uh, the way that Intel use Grillo here is precisely to deal with uh, all the content grabbing part. Um, and as you can see, the, the user experience is consistent. It doesn't matter if you are browsing or searching podcasts, if you are searching or browsing YouTube or Tracker or whatever, it's the same user experience all the time. That makes it a lot more streamlined uh, than in other cases. And, and, the, and the thing is that by using Reload, you get this out of the box because you just get a single API and you don't have to know if you're dealing with YouTube or with Vimeo or with any other thing. So for, for you as a developer, it's straightforward to do a consistent user experience. Uh, another good thing is that um, I don't know what plugins will Intel bring with, with, with this on, on Migo Netbook, but I just, the plugins I have here some, are just some uh, kind of plugins that, that I wrote for, 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 for Grillo. I deploy them and they just work as you, uh, as you saw before with YouTube, uh, YouTube with Vimeo. Uh, if I had more plugins, I could deploy them and, and they would just work out of the box without Intel having to write code specifically to deal with these services. And if in the future I, I write more plugins for Willow, I just deploy them and it will just work. Okay, so. Uh, and now, um, for those who are more interested in seeing how this works from a programmer point of view, uh, what, code, what kind of code you have to write to do things like that, I'm going to show uh, some very small example. Is uh, this uh, that I have here. It's basically uh, a sandbox application that we use for testing the, the, the framework. Um, it is basically a, a search functionality. So you have on the top uh, an, a text entry, you write the text you want to search uh, and select on the combo uh, the actual media provider you want to search content from. Then you tap the search button and we fill up this uh, list view with, with the content that, that we wrap. 
So what, what I'm going to, search, to show you is what happens when I click on the, on the search button, okay? Okay, so um, this is the important part. So basically, once I have selected uh, a source, which is the actual media provider, Yamendo was the one that I, I was showing in that, in that picture before, we basically use this URL media source search API, and that's the only API I, I have to use for searching on any, on any backend. Uh, I basically give the, the source that I want to use, uh, the text that the user input, uh, the browse keys are a collection of, well, it's, it's just a list of metadata information I'm interested in retrieving. Like, for example, in that example I showed before is uh, the thumbnail, the icon, and the, um, and the title of the media. But you can maybe request the URL or, uh, I don't know, uh, artist album information or whatever. Uh, then I... Um, get some paging information, how many items do I want to retrieve, uh, some flags to control certain aspects of how the operation performs, and a uh, callback because this API has to be asynchronous to not block the UI while everything is going on. So uh, I pass the callback information and for every result that matches my request, it will be, uh, this, this callback will be invoked with, with the actual media. And it returns a, a, a search ID, which I can use when I get the results to match results with operations in case I have multiple operations of ongoing at the same time. Um, we also allow to do uh, searches on multiple uh, services at the same time. So if you maybe are interested in grabbing content related with, uh, I don't know, the word rock, but you don't care if it's YouTube or Jamend or any particular service, you just use the URL multiple interface that I have here, which is basically the same one, but accepts a list of, of media providers uh, or null, like in this case, for all of available providers. Okay, so this is the only code I have to write to deal with the actual media grabbing part. Let's see now what I do when, when I actually get the content, how it looks like, how it looks like. So, Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, uh, okay, so this is the callback that is invoked every time uh, a matching result is found. Okay, so basically uh, we provide the, the, the media provider that's actually given the result, uh, the search ID, as I said before, so when I get the result, I know which operation triggered it. Triggered it. Then I get this URL media object, which is the, the, the actual object encapsulating the, the media that match my request. So then there is a specific API that I can use to grab all the information like uh, URL media get title, URL media get thumbnail, URL media get uh, URI or whatever. Then we get this remaining parameter, which is basically a hint on how, um, how many more elements will be coming after this one. 
So when it reaches zero, it means that the operation is finished. And then the, the data we pass for the callback and an error parameter in case there was an actual error. So, and typically a callback would look like this. First we check the error. If there's an error, we bail out probably. Then we check the media. If there's media, I grab all the metadata I requested, do what I want to do with that. Maybe if I want to play it immediately, I get the URI information, which I have requested before when I pass the list of metadata I was interested in retrieving and pass it to the, to the player. If I just want to show a list, as I showed in that picture before, I just grab, in this case, the thumbnail, the title, and put it in, in a list view. It depends on what you want to do. But at this point, you have this object, which kind of has all the, all the metadata you requested, and you, you just get it and, and do what, what you need to do. And typically, you would check if, it's, if this was the last item, and you do some cleanup after that, probably, like changing the UI state or whatever. And that's basically all there is to it. So this was the search use case, but browsing, like in a UPnP server, for example, or when browsing a file system or something like that is the very same thing. Instead of passing text to search, you pass a GRL media object that represents the folder you want to, to browse. And, and the callback and all the other stuff is just the same. So in, the, both operations are really very similarly implemented. Uh, there, there's, of course, more APIs than just browsing and searching. You can do more stuff, but for a quick walkthrough, this is all I wanted to show. And finally, I would like to uh, conclude this presentation talking about uh, the role of, of Willo in Migo. Um, so basically, the idea is that I think Willo uh, could fill a technological gap present in most modern platforms, as I said before, we're trying to address a problem that was not, ten, was not here 10 years ago. And I think modern platforms are not providing developers with tools to deal with this and really is trying to, to do that. So in the case of Migo, there is nothing like Relo, I think. So it could fit because of that. Uh, so basically, it would make the, the platform more appealing to media developers because having something like Relo available would make media solution development faster and more efficient, which is a good way to attract developers to the Migo community. Huh? Okay. Um, uh, then on, on the technical side, Will is based on Julib, which is already part of, of, of the core Migo stack. So basically that means that integrating Willow in Migo solutions is straightforward. Actually, the, the Intel guys that developed that Media Explorer application I showed before didn't have any kind of complication using Relo. They just added it as a dependency of their, of their Media Explorer. And even though Relo is not part of Migo, it's, it's very easy to, to, to develop with it Migo applications. Okay, so uh, since Qt is the uh, preferred toolkit for developing Migo solutions, uh, we don't have at the moment uh, Qt bindings, but uh, first, it's not really needed. I mean, you can write Qt applications that use Willow anyway. Uh, it's just a, a C library, so you can use it. Uh, but anyway, some, so I, I've, I've been talking to some uh, Qt developers, and sometimes they get back to me and say, it would be nice if, if you have some bindings to make it more uh, Qt friendly. Uh, so that's something we don't have right now, but if the Migo community is interested in having Grillo and using Grillo and we see that and they, they demand that, well, we, we would definitely do that. Um, I think what would be more interesting is TML bindings, uh, not this Grillo and QT bindings. If, you're, if you want to do it, which of course you can go to plus and do Q, just by brute force, but it would be nice to have some TML plugins to make it all instantly available in TML and easy to do. Okay. Uh, for example, you showed some data model, uh, you know, where it's getting back some information. If there's a way to get that back into the TML data model so you can run it. Okay, yeah. Like yeah, yeah, probably that makes a lot of sense, yeah. Um, then uh, I was mentioning that Willow was based on Julib, and so it doesn't have any kind of external dependencies, but um, uh, that may not be the case for the plugins. I think most of the plugins are also based on Julib, so should not be a problem, but some plugins may use libraries that are not part of the Migo stack. 
Uh, I think that's normal. I mean, uh, uh, Willow was developed uh, not particularly for Migo, and um, I think at that point there might be even libraries in the Migo platform that would deal, for example, with YouTube or with some other thing, and I think that makes sense. Uh, in that case, we would be developing uh, clients that are specifically fit for, for the Migo platform using the libraries that come with the, with the Migo stack, and that would make perfect sense in my opinion. And finally, um, thinking about uh, the verticals that Migo is targeting, we find handsets, set-top box, smart TVs, vehicle infotainment, and netbooks. And in all of them, you can find that multimedia is probably an important use case. And in all of them, you can probably find that uh, you can write solutions that uh, products, uh, create products that come with internet connectivity. So this is precisely the, the kind of, of uh, solutions in which Google can be useful. So basically, that means that uh, vir virtually any media developer for Migo could be interested in, in using Google. And well, that was all. Um, if you want to know more about Grillo or see more demos or whatever, I, I would be happy to talk to you. We, I am in, in Atigalia's booth in the technology showcase, so just come by and talk to me. And that was all. If you have any questions, I can try to, to answer. Yes? Browse um, are those specifically back end or? No, no. Oh. Well, actually, there are what we call system keys, which are like, for example, title or thumbnail, which are kind of cross service. Yeah, but, but maybe a Nintendo title would be called title. Right? No, no, it's title is title for all of them. Okay. Uh, but then it's possible to write plugins that are dynamic keys, like keys that we have not implemented in the framework, but make sense in one particular plugin. So that's possible. But we try to make all the keys uh, service independent as well. Well, uh, I, we don't have plans to to develop them. Uh, I mean, we, as I was saying before, uh, I think this project only makes sense if we manage to get a, a, a community of interested parties working. So maybe if one party develops one, uh, another party develops another, and then we, of course, would help. But if it's only a few people trying to develop all the all the plugins and maintaining all of them then it's all the, all the same problem all over again, so it, it doesn't make sense. Yes? Um, for your YouTube feeds and views, uh, often Paul made that there are actually flash videos or flash animations and that's in one spot and you can't just get them back. Exactly, yeah. Video. Do you have a way of falling back to just putting it in a web? Exactly, yeah. Uh, so basically, the, in, as he was saying, uh, if you read the uh, conditions for the YouTube API, uh, they won't allow you to use direct streams uh, unless you get, of course, permission for YouTube, you got to deal with them. Uh, if you don't have that, then you can't use them. And in that case, what we provide is just, uh, instead of requesting the, the URI of the, of the media, you can what we call external player or external URL. So you basically get the, the site URL, so you can open a browser, or you can get the, the JavaScript play your URL so you can embed that into an HTML5 application, for example. Yeah, it would be nice if, if you had a way of it being instantly switching in sort of a web view or flash um, in, you know, in the hole or in the media player there so that if it just happens to be the wrong kind of video for YouTube or the wrong font size, then it's probably going to flash and you actually be advertising. Mm, yeah, okay. Yeah, so um, we have uh, mm, Python bindings. So if you want to use Python for your application, you can use Willow anyway, no problem with that. But on the plugin side, at the moment, we don't support developing with Python. At the moment, we have kind of plans for doing that at some point in the future, but not yet. Is there a top level? 
Now, I did. Uh, well, maybe uh, there is a, a sandbox application, and the one I showed before. Mm -hmm. Maybe it got it got installed. It's called reload uh, dash test dash UI. I don't know if that's installed. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, you are, it's not on the middle platform, that, I mean, the, the right that what we did was, um, in GNOME there is this, this specification uh, about how different applications can share media content, uh, so they have a DBAS API for that, and uh, so, for example, we, came to do that work when we asked the Totten developers how they could use Grillo, and they said that they didn't want to load all the plugins in, in Totems, I mean, in, in the Totem process. And they have this specification for, for media sharing. And basically, uh, the idea is that you have Rigel, uh, and you have a, a separate uh, daemon process loading all, this, all these plugins from Grillo, and they interact through a uh, GNOME, or I don't know if it's free desktop, but I think it's GNOME uh, DBAS a, a protocol. And yeah, since it's very specific to GNOME, it's not in MIGO. Um, so it's GNOME specific. And what is the native uh, system that is supported on the GI? Do you do the transcoding on your end? No, we don't do the transcoding. Okay. Yes? Mm -hmm. What about that? Well, does it happen? Uh, well, well, when you transfer, for example, oh, the just get yes, yes, no, no, no. I, I, uh, it, it was in the, in the example, but maybe you didn't. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, it's it's one of the parameters. You just pass the stopping index and and the and the offset. Uh, sorry, the offset and the and the page size that you want to request, and that's it. Any more questions? Yes, yes, there's a public API, so if you want to write a, a plugin, uh, there is certain uh, APIs that you have, for example, the search, you implement the search functionality, there's an API for that you have to implement. Uh, I think we have some documentation in the repository. I hope it's up to date, I think so, but uh, we, I mean, if you ever want to write some plugin and you don't uh, see how exactly you can do that, Yes, ask us on, on the mailing list or IRC and we'll be more than uh, glad to help you. Okay, so thank you very much. That was all.